Welcome to the Live Scope Masterclass. There is no doubt if you've purchased this program that you're ready to step onto the water and catch more fish. But it's just not as easy as turning it on. And that's where I come in. I'm going to break down everything from the installation needs, the battery needs. I'm going to break down wiring needs. I'm going to talk you through your initial setups, your on the water setups. I'm even going to offer my opinion on which units I believe are the best. Um, I'm going to offer you troubleshooting areas where you can take a look at something on the water, quickly troubleshoot it, get yourself back to fishing. I'm going to offer species, specific settings, um, and, and that's going to help you be able to dial in to a, a specific species and have the proper settings for that particular fish in that day. That's also going to help you catch more fish where you're not messing around a whole lot. And we're going to go through the entire Garmin live scope. But the great thing is, instead of me rushing as I do on other videos that I've done to try to get it in on a three minute time period, I'm going to take my time and thoroughly explain to you. We, and when we break down a battery, we're going to break down more than just saying, hey, get a lithium battery. We're going to break down why I believe you should get a lithium battery why I believe you should have dedicated power to your live scope and the unit that it's hooked to. This and many other things is going to make this the most in-depth and thorough class you have ever taken. So guys, let's get straight into this journey and thank you so much for purchasing the Live Soap Master Class. Thank you so much guys. Let's get going. All right, guys, in this portion of our class, we're going to talk about power needs. One of the most important parts of the live scope setup is your power. Um, there are so many people that uh, try to get away with hooking it to your, um, your cranking battery. Um, some even try to hook it to their trolling motor batteries. The number one rule, and I'm, I'm not the only one who believes this, this is pretty much an industry standard now, is good, clean power. And what I mean by clean power is the live scope box and the, and the unit, and this is my opinion right here, the unit it is running off of um, needs to have its own separate power source. Um, that is very critical. Um, if you try to hook it to your cranking battery, for example, and the live wells cut on, the bilge pumps cut on, other units are hooked into there. There's so many power needs in today's fishing boats that if you do that, you're just asking for problems with interference. With everything being um, electronic in today's boats, interference is one of your number one demons you will fight. You will fight this problem whether it be your trolling motors, your other fish finders, um, I mean, even your running lights running back and forth. There are so many things that are, that are fighting against you and going against you in live scope. You need to make sure that you can control the variable that you can control, and that is good, clean power. Um, you want to have that power. In my opinion, lithium batteries are the only way to go. Now, it doesn't have to be this particular brand. Uh, there are several. I mean, and nowadays there's there's probably close to 100 different brands on the market that sell good lithium batteries. Uh, but you do need to make sure they're deep cycle type batteries. Um, I recommend a minimum of 30 amps. That's what this one is. And if you can get, and if you can afford to, absolutely, I would even go higher into the 40, 50 amp range. Um, but 30 is a minimum. I run 30. Um, it's very light. I think the thing is maybe, I mean, and most all of them are like this, maybe three or four pounds. Uh, very light, very easy to put uh, and mount into an area. Then, but I am 100% convinced that lithium is the only way because the power and the voltage, the amperage stays consistent. Um, Whereas lead batteries, the moment you start drawing power from them, the voltage and the amps are on a constant downhill turn. With lithium, that, that bar, or that plateau, it stays level. Now, one thing about lithium, when it gets to the end of where it runs out of power, 
it'll just literally die in a matter of a few seconds. Where lead seems like it's dying a slow death from the time you turn it on. So your, your pitcher will constantly be degrading and going down. So the thing that you need, in, in my opinion, you need to have good lithium batteries, at least 30 amps, 40 to 50 if you can afford it. But a 30 amp is a very minimum. You can run a 10 inch screen all day long with the black box, all day long, no problems with a 30 amp uh, lithium battery. And you're gonna get good, clean pictures. Make sure that the black box and that unit are the only things drawing power off this battery. And therefore you've cut down pretty much 95% of the interference or you know crosstalk that you're gonna have. So get yourself a lithium battery and make sure that only the black box and that unit are powered off of this lithium battery. All right, guys, in this section, what we're gonna talk about, after we've already determined the battery types we need and the battery power that is needed, now we're going to go into actually connecting the battery to the units. It's very important to do a few things. First of all, in my opinion, and opinions may vary on this, but after all the time I've spent with LiveScope, I have found to get the best picture possible, I wanna get my battery as close to the units as possible. Um, the shorter that wiring is, it seems like I get a better, uh, I get a better picture, I get uh, better voltage and better amp, uh, you know, from the battery to the units. Now, the second, and very, very important thing is this. You want to use, at the very minimum, 10-gate marine-grade wire. Now, I'm going to put it uh, right up in here, um, you know, right up in the corner here, what it is. It's 10-gauge marine-grade wire. Now, I have done some videos in the past where we talk about the difference in, say, regular 10-gauge wire and 10-gauge marine-grade wire. 10 gauge marine grade wire is often bigger than your normal OEM wire. Um, it's actually probably closer to like eight or nine gauge wire. And it has a special coating on it which resists uh, rust and also resists vibration, which is good because in a boat you get lots of vibration and things like that, which is also gonna make it a little bit more pliable, which in turn will make it less likely to break. And you don't want any broken strands. You want to get as much power from that battery to that unit as possible. That's very important. And secondly, you want to have a cutoff switch. Either by way of, you want to interrupt uh, the ground or the negative. I suggest interrupting the ground. Some people suggest interrupting the, the, uh, the, the positive cable to it. Um, but interrupting and that way you can cut all power from the battery to the black box. The black box has a small trickle to it. And if you leave it, say, over a week or two weeks time, you can come back and oftentimes if your battery charger is not hooked up to your battery, I do it all the time. I keep my battery charger hooked up where it's always hot and stays charging. But if you do happen to unleave it, uh, un leave it unhooked for a long time, you'll come back and your battery will have drawn down. Although may not be all the way down, you will lose some of your, uh, you know, lose some of your amps over time because it is a constant draw on the black box. Now, the, the black box will come alive when you turn your unit on, but it always has a small amount of draw. So you always want to put a disconnect switch, an on-off type switch. Me, I run, I have a disconnect switch, just a simple toggle switch uh, hooked up. That way I can kill the power to the black box. And then thirdly, uh, I want to recommend this, that you put in a fuse box. Um, there are several great companies out there that make marine grade uh, fuse boxes. Uh, a little, you know, just something where you can have each, you know, your fish finder, you can have your black box run into, and you can have a regular bus style fuse to, uh, and I don't like the inline fuses that much. I want all my fuses in one central location. That way I can look down there and see if something is blown 
and I can simply replace it, put another fuse in, and it's ready to go. So three things, short distance between your battery and your unit, number one. Number two, 10 gauge marine grade wire. And number three, I don't like the inline fuses. I like a fuse box or uh, fuse panel, whatever the actual name of it is called. That's what I like. And I think it's the best way to go. I think it's the best for your system to have all three of those together. And I think it makes for a cleaner, tidier system. I'm not going to go into actually how you run the wires. There's thousands of videos on that. I'm telling you what the essential things is, which I believe will make your unit operate better, easier to troubleshoot, and make it where you have less failure on the water because nothing's more uh, frustrating than when you show up and you push your live scope and, you li and your battery's dead because you didn't have a disconnect switch or you lose power halfway through the day. Those type of deals, or you blow a fuse and you got to pull them off and try to find an inline fuse. Those three things that I'm telling you about are going to make you have a more efficient day and they're going to have you make you, you know, keep your frustration down in the long run. So guys, I hope you help. I hope this helps you with the battery and now the wiring issue and how I set up my units. Hey guys, in this part of the class, what we're going to talk about is units. Which units work best, in my opinion, for live scope? Now, there are two different thought processes on this. Thought processes on this. You have your touchscreen units. And you have your units which are manually adjusted, say the GPS map 1022 and 1222 series. Uh, you have your echo map series. Um, and within those families, even the GPS map series, there are some touchscreen series. In my opinion, um, and a lot of people are going to differ on this subject, the touchscreen units are not the way you want to go for live scope. Now, there are a lot of people who are very successful with uh, touchscreen units, and 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 they and they do a great job with them. But in this, for for what I use and how I use it, I believe a series like the GPS Map 1022 and 1222 are your best series. They are standalone units. Um, they require a black box to operate. Um, and therefore, they're, they will be dedicated to live scope. And by being dedicated to live scope, um, they're only going to show live scope unless you network another unit into them. And that can be covered in a little bit different, uh, you know, a little different time. But right now, I'm going to say the reason I use the the touch uh, the keypad or the 1022 or the 1222 version over the touch screen is accuracy of adjustments when you're using live scope being able to adjust rapidly and with a purpose is the key to using it and getting back fishing when you use a touchscreen unit for example um, you have to push the buttons individually they have little buttons on the screen and I'll show you this and if you look in the top right hand corner um, it'll be right there <laughs> You'll see these touch. You'll see these little buttons that you must push. Now the problem with these buttons are that if you don't hit them perfectly, it will pause the screen, and then you have to push the little play button to get the screen back going. Now this might be a slight inconvenience to some, but for somebody who's trying to rapidly adjust, for example, if you're scanning for uh, crappie uh, tops or brush piles you see them at 60 and then you want to dial it in really quickly to 20 or 30 that way you can fish them if you hit the button then you have to push play because the screen is paused it can be a little bit um, it can be aggravating and, and it starts to aggravate you especially as the day goes on as you're trying to really work fast as you can to catch fish the 1022 and the 1222 series have a knob that knob is you turn it to adjust up and down for forward distance, push it in, and then you can adjust the gain, push it in again, and you can adjust the depth. Those are very accurate. They're, 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 you, you're not even pushing any buttons, you're simply turning a knob. And I will put that up in the corner right here where you can take a look at that. And by doing, using the knob, your, your adjustments are precise 
they're quick, and you're not having to worry about pausing the screen because nothing you do on that knob can pause the screen. And that is why I, uh, you know, I kind of go toward those type units. Now that's not saying that some of the GPS map units and some of the echo map units uh, don't have great pictures. We're not talking about picture in this one. We're talking about simply the ease and accuracy of adjustments. And that is why I tend to choose non-touchscreen units for my LiveScope application. All right, guys, in this section right here, we're gonna talk about a few of the accessories that you may want to purchase to better help you uh, use your live scope. Um, there are a few accessories that, that I use. First of all, you may want to use an elevated mount. Um, and that goes for your unit. Um, because not everybody can go out and purchase a 12 or 16 inch unit. Nobody, not everybody can do that. So there's tricks and tips to doing this that you can purchase a, say, a raised mount. Now, I'm not gonna plug any brand here. Uh, I'll let you make that. There's several different brands that make great mounts, very strong mounts, but you may wanna purchase a mount that raises it up off of the floor um, and gets it closer to your eye, um, especially for crappie fishing. People who sit down, you can almost get that screen right in your face. Uh, for bass fishermen, you'll want to get that screen up as high as you can. That way you can, you know, get a good look at the fish and how he's reacting to your bait. And uh, that right there is going to help increase your success, especially for guys who have to purchase, say, a 9-inch unit or a 10-inch unit. That may be perfect for you because you may not be able to afford those 12-inch units, and that's okay because not everybody can. Those units are crazy expensive. And so by purchasing a mount that raises up in the air, and we're going to show you some of these things in, uh, in the second part of this right here, but by purchasing some of these, these uh, mounts, you can take a 9-inch unit, make it give it that feel of that 10 or 12-inch unit by raising it up in your face. And that right there is going to help you get better vision of your bait and how the fish are reacting. Secondly, you may want to purchase, and I, I personally suggest this, a, a, a different mount. Um, I am big on perspective mode. Um, I use it probably as much or more as I use it in forward mode. Um, the Garmin itself mount, it's a good mount, it's a strong mount, but the problem with it is it is locked into place. When you're using perspective mode or even forward mode, adjustability of the mount is the name of the game. Perspective mode, I like to be able to adjust my mount where my beam is not almost not even hitting the bottom and in some cases not hitting the bottom because I'm trying to highlight what's into the water column. If I'm chasing schooling fish, I'm on, I don't want to hit the bottom because I'm not worried about what's on the bottom. I am looking for what's up in the water column. If I'm, say, in the pre-spawn where those fish are pulling up onto a flat and they're hanging on stumps before they move back into the spawning grounds, I want to angle it down a little bit more. That way I can see these individual stumps and I can make accurate represent, uh, presentations to those stumps with my bait. I've caught so many big fish in the pre-spawn by just going across flats, not making cast, seeing a stump, then bam, making that accurate cast with the perspective mode. With Garmin's mount, it kind of limited to one angle, so you can't do that. So I suggest you purchase an aftermarket uh, type perspective mode. Several great companies. I'm not plugging companies. I'm telling you that there's a few of them out there that do a great job uh, and you know, in, in allowing you to adjust your beam angle. And beam angle is so important. And we talk about that in another chapter, but right now we're talking about accessories. And thirdly, one that I am uh, convinced is the only way to go. You know, and, and some pros, a lot of the pro bass fishermen, they swear by putting it on the trolling motor shaft. Nothing wrong with that. If it fits your style of fishing, so be it. But me, I like my transducer on a motorized pole. Now they make hand operated poles, they make motorized poles. I think there's some poles out there that have, uh, they literally lock onto a cover. Um, and the reason I like a motorized pole is this. When you use spot lock, which is one of the most innovative things to come along in fishing in a long time, spot lock, anchor lock, whatever you want to call it, 
when you use that mode and your and your transducers on your trolling motor that trolling motor is constantly going back and forth it is very 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 hard to stay locked onto an object a brush pile or fish when the trans with it in spot lock if the transducer is on the trolling motor shaft it's dang near impossible unless the wind is very strong and you're headed perfectly into it very hard if all by using the spot lock and stronger winds or no wind at all and then using the motorized pole to really hone in on what you're looking at i think your versatility is so much more uh, some people use a handheld pole uh, and those work great also, but I like both of my hands free. Now, I'm not telling you any of these three ways are better. I'm simply giving you my opinion and telling you how I do it. Um, I like the motorized pole. I, when I put it in spot lock, which I use a lot, I use that motorized pole to really scan the areas. And if I see a fish, I don't have to worry about turning the troll motor. I'm not in here. So I will scan an area, see a fish, concentrate on it. If I don't catch it, then I'll move forward and may hit the spot lock again or whatever. But for example, if I'm fishing uh, cypress trees and I'm going down the edge of the bank and there's tons of cypress trees and I'm using perspective mode, I will angle that pole at a 45 degree angle and it, the picture stays good, solid. It doesn't go back and forth because I'm not on the trolling motor. So then I can use my trolling motor to position anyhow I want to. I angle that uh, perspective mode about a 45 degree angle at the bank and I can see each thing that I'm casting to, each tree, each piece of cover. And that's why I tend to think that on a pole is better. Now, don't get me wrong. There are several, several uh, big time names. Josh Jones, for one, who uses it on his trolling motor and it fits his style. But my style tends to be, I want to fish each tree, each piece of cover a lot more thoroughly and not have to worry about the trolling motor. So a lot of times I use that spot lock, probably use it more than I ever have since I got the motorized pole. Even when I'm, uh, say, crappie fishing, even if I'm not using spot lock, I will still use that motorized pole to make those fine-tuned adjustments and really hone in to see where those bigger fish are. Because a lot of times they don't just say get onto a brush pile they'll get off to the sides. And if you're locked onto a brush pile, you can't scan back and forth. So that is why I use the motorized pole. Now I'm not saying it's the only one, but there are several different brands that make them out there. Uh, Live Foot makes one, Live Scanner makes one, um, Right Height makes one, all good units. Uh, not gonna say one is better than the other. Um, I have a Live Foot on my boat and it works great, but that's not the only brand. Um, there's several other brands so a good mount a good transducer mount where you can get perspective and really angle it and say a, a pole of some sorts those are three accessories you may want to purchase to fit your style of fishing a little bit better as we talked about before there are a few different ways you can mount uh, your transducer i actually have two different transducers on here right now Here's an LVS-34 transducer and an LVS-32. Um, your mounting options are only kind of limited by your imagination. Um, but the two main ways are on the trolling motor shaft and on a, on a motorized or handheld pole. Um, I prefer the motorized pole. I don't prefer it mounting it on the trolling motor shaft, but I put them on here for you to be able to see the different styles. Um, each has their advantages and each has, I would say maybe their disadvantages, but the advantages of mounting it on the trolling motor is that you have less, uh, there's less, there's less up here on the front of the boat to worry about hitting stumps and things like that. You know, it's, it's one piece with the trolling motor shaft, you know, the direction is pointed. You don't even have to hardly look down because most people know their trolling motor direction by simply by feel and years of using the trolling motor. So you know your trolling motor is pointed in one direction. You know your shat, your transducer is pointed in that direction also. Uh, it's very advantageous. A lot of big bass hunters use that. Uh, Josh Jones uses it to very high success rate. A lot of crappie fishermen use it like that. That's not how I use it. I, I prefer to use it in a different manner. I like mine mounted um, on a pole. On a, and mine's on a motorized pole. I like it on a motorized pole because it allows me to use the spot lock. 
when you have it on the transducer, using your spot lock is almost totally eliminated. And in the wintertime, in the fall, it's really windy. Even early spring, it's really windy. And so sometimes you can't use your perspective. I mean, you can't use your uh, spot lock at all. But when I have it on a shaft, I can hit that spot lock and not worry about the boat. And then I can just fine tune this with the pedals. Now this particular model right here has motorized pedals. Uh, you just push the button and the, the, the shaft turns right here. And that is what turns your uh, transducer in the direction you want. The disadvantages to that are you literally have to look at the directional indicator on top of the unit to see which direction your transducer is pointed. There is no feel because those pedals, they don't, it's not like a rocker style like on a, trans, on a trolling motor. So you have to actually look and line your arrow up and cast down your arrow. Now that once you get used to that, that's an okay thing. That's what I prefer. But some people don't because they don't want to look down at their transducer. They don't want to have to know it. They just know it by feel. And that's why they tend to use on the, on the trolling motor. Me, I don't mind looking at the, the directional indicator on top of the shaft, knowing which direction mine is going. I've got used to it. There are several people that use the power poles. Jason Christie, Bassmaster Classic Champion, he uses a right height turret, very good pole. He uses it uh, to great success, and he, you know, he and he targeted a lot of his fish in the Classic using the live scope. But he used it because he, what he had to do was he had to look and see which direction that shaft is, going, uh, shaft is going by the directional indicator. That's not a problem, but it's, it's, it's how you fish, your style of fishing, and, and it's simply, you know, it's personal preference more than anything. But I want to give you an option of which way to use both of them. So I hope that helps kind of differentiate the ways you can use. Um, and you choose which way is best for you. I've kind of laid out some positives and some negatives to both of them, and you have to weigh those and choose. But either one of them are very successful, and both of them are very fine ways to catch a lot of fish. It just depends on your style. And honestly, the poles are very expensive. I mean, they're, they're upwards of $1,000. So that's another expense that we talk about having to have. I mean, you can lose yourself $10,000 in these things if you're not careful. And, and, it, and it can get that way in a hurry. If you, you have to learn, you have to know your limits, of course, and that's not me to preach financial things to you, but you have to know your limits on what you want and what you can afford. And I, that's why in the little accessory section, I gave you some, some different options to look at and to think about maybe adding to your live scope to help your setup and help you be more efficient and match the style of fishing which you do and you know match the style that you want to uh, try to uh, try to emulate or you know like some of the big game big name guys or create your own style so I hope that helps showing you the different couple styles of mounting and and if you want let's grab this old camera and you can see it here there is the one on the train on the on the trolling motor shaft and here's the one on the actual live scanner uh, shaft that turns by motorized pole. And it, it hooks up off a simple 12 volt power. The pedals, and I'll show you those. They're right there, they're just right and left. You just click them, very simple, very easy. But find the, find the accessory or the mounting option that fits your needs. And then you buy that, or if you're only putting it on a trolling motor, you don't have to buy anything and then you'll be happy and you'll be more efficient on the water. All right, guys, what we're gonna talk about now is proper transducer orientation. We're gonna do the LVS 32 first, and we're gonna do the LVS 34 secondly. So first, let's do the LVS 32, and let's take a look at how it's oriented in the forward, the down, and the perspective positioning. And then we'll take a look at the LVS-34, the newest transducer that Garmin offers for the live scope. And by doing that, you'll see that some of the problems that we had in the 32 have been remedied in the 34. So let's take a look at that 
and I think this will better help you get your transducer oriented correctly and then you'll be able to catch more fish on the water. So let's take a look at both transducers right now. All right, let's talk about, and I'm not in this video, just the transducer in my lovely hands. We're going to talk about orientation of the LVS-34 transducer. The LVS-34 transducer is much easier to orient and orient correctly. Um, one of the things that has been the biggest uh, thorn in the side of the 32 was the fact that if you mounted it on the port side, uh, which is the left, you had to mount it like this. But if you mounted it on the starboard side, the right side of the shaft, you had to mount it like this, with this part bottom, and it angled backwards. And that confused a lot of folks. So what Garmin did to remedy this, and I'm gonna try to keep it in the frame here, I'm doing my best, is, they created a through bolt design. That bolt goes through from either direction. And by doing that, it made it very simple and consistent to mount. If you mount it on the starboard side, it's mounted there. You stick the bolt through, you screw it in. I'm not gonna screw it in all the way. But if you wanted to mount it on the port side, you would simply loosen this, turn it over, And this is always mounted in the front of the shaft. This part right here is the front of the shaft. Now with it turned over, you still mount it exactly the same. Cord in the back, and you line up your little notches right there. You put your, your three, uh, bolt through, and it's now in the forward position on the port side port being left of the shaft. We're calling toward the camera being the front. So it's very simple as you see and very consistent. Much easier. All you need to know is the cord needs to be in the back regardless. That is going to eliminate a lot of problems and a lot of confusion. Now to simply go to perspective mode all you do is loosen this one, rotate it down. I'm going to loosen a little bit more. Rotate it down. There's a notch on top tighten it up and then you will simply make sure this is perpendicular to this or there is a notch and then you would tighten it up that is perspective mode simple easy easy to understand uh, I got to say that they have done a wonderful job in that in this in in making sure that um, it's easy to understand and easily switchable so, I mean very easily we could go back to the starboard side we've got that we pull the shaft out of this once we get it out let's see if we'll get it out of there in a minute and remember cord in the back just like always line your notches up and there you go you would put the bolt you go through there with the bolt line it up screw it in and it's in forward position now forward position is a slight this would be down with the top parallel forward is one click back and there's a notch a white notch on here and you just tighten up your bolts and there you go that'd be the forward star star position and then we'll you could very easily flip it over make sure the cords in the back pull the bolt out come in from the other side for the starboard for the port side excuse me forward position both of these very consistent again for the down position top flat that is down positioning this is one of the easiest most simple mounts that I have ever seen Garmin did a wonderful job with this much better than the very difficult to handle LVS 32 All right, we're going to talk about the LVS-32. 
and the proper forward and down orientation of those two positions. Now, we're on the starboard side, the camera being the front of the boat. We're on the starboard side, which is the right side. <clears throat> now, in order for it to be correct, I'm going to turn the shaft for you. That way you can see it. That's still the front. In order for you to be able to orient it in the correct forward position, you have to make sure the bottom is parallel to the water and it is tilted back. Now, um, if this is a Summit Fishing Equipment Outdoors mount, a perspective mount. So it makes it pretty easy for me to adjust it and show you what's going on. But it needs to be, this is the starboard side, the bottom being flat. Now, why this is so much more difficult than the LVS-34, which has a tr through bolt design is, and I will show you. What we're gonna do is we're gonna rotate this around to the port side. Now, remember the boat is, the front of the boat is the camera. I'm gonna rotate it around where you can see. Now, that's the way we had it for the starboard side. But being that it's on the port side, and I'll show you, it's on the port side, which is the left side of the boat, or the left side of the shaft, you must make sure that the top is flat. Now, why do we have to do that? As you can see, there's one beam pointing down, one receptacle pointing slightly forward, and then one pointing almost perfectly forward. Because you're pointing in forward positioning toward the camera being forward. Those rays are bouncing out, and these are the receptacles for when they come back. Now, if you're on the starboard side, remember, we're gonna switch that over real quick. Starboard side, which is this being the front, the right side. Notice how we have it, the bottom flat. Now, once again, why? Because there's one pointing forward, one receptacle, another receptacle, and then this one pointing straight down. Your beam is mostly out with slight amounts pointing down. Remember, there's five rays and three receptacles right here. And those receive the beam or whatever it bounces back from, and then that sends it up the uh, line to the black box, which converts it, and then it shows up on your fish finder screen. So, very important, starboard side, starboard side, cord in front, bottom flat, that's a starboard side forward mount, forward uh, position. Now, we'll ro rotate this around. This is port side. I'm going to show it to you here. Port side is flat on top, cord in back, and they're angled forward. That's port side. Now, how do we get to the down positioning? Very simple. It's just this one, it's one click forward. So now we have one beam, one receptacle pointing backwards, one pointing forwards, one pointing straight down. Now, when you're on the start, when you're on the port side, remember this is where we started right here. Cord in front, bottom flat, angle toward the front of the boat, front of the boat being this way. You would, you would one click down and now you have one beam, one receptacle pointing forward, one pointing backwards, and one pointing straight down. That way you can cover the entire 135 degrees. So there you go. Starboard side, that's what it would look like. Cord forward to the front of the boat or the front of the trolling motor, bottom flat. Straight into this. This is forward mode i have it on the the starboard side of the mount uh this is forward mode uh, this being flat this angled back but people want to know how easy is it to change with this is the summit uh fishing equipment.com summit outdoors mount how easy is it to get to perspective mode you twist, and I'm gonna. This has a breakaway mount. That's what that is. Uh, you twist, and let me see. It's hard to do it with one hand. Twist, roll up. 
So let me go through that again. Now, it's sitting here like this. You're going to twist like this, and the, the, the shaft trying to break away makes it a little bit harder. And then you simply twist up. Now, I have been doing this long enough as a perspective, I'm big into, you know, big prime perspective mode guy, that I know that this to this, and actually somebody told me that, but this pretty much is pretty straight. You can take this corner, run a straight line across, make sure it's perpendicular to that, and you're pretty much straight. Because this beam right here, the middle one, uh, is perfectly straightforward. This points to the left, this points to the right. That creates your 135 degrees. There's five different beams in there. But here's what we got to do. We're going to talk about this. <clears throat> Don't pay attention to this part. Pay attention to this. Garmin's mount is about like that, pointed down at that angle. And I'm sitting on a candid uh, boat ramp, but understand what I'm doing. Now, if you do it like this, where it's perfectly, the mount is perfectly per, uh, parallel to the water, the beam will be shooting upwards. Upwards at an angle, and that's where you get all the surface uh, waves. You get to see a lot of the surface. If there's trash up there, you can see that very well. If there's leaves floating, you can very well see that. That is good if you're trying to fish a buzzbait you, or a frog. You can see your buzzbait and frogs on this. But for the purpose of fishing trees, like we were in yesterday's video, a slight down angle, not that's flat. Now watch how much I bend it. That much. That much. Now, I may, after looking at the beam on the screen, I may decide that I need to go down a touch more or up a touch more because remember, I'm trying to get the beam flat. Now that that's angled downward, the beam should be flat or parallel to the water's edge. I hope that explains it. If you want to see again how fast it switches back, there you go. Money in the bank. All right, let's take a look at the effects of having the wrong angle. This angle, as you can see in the top right-hand corner, is angled too far down. Now, what that's going to do is provide a lot of blackness far out but only provide detail really close to the transducer. This is not what we're looking for, not at all. Now this second clip, as you notice, the angle in the top right hand corner changed. Now you still, you get a lot better detail. You can see each little individual dot. That's an actual dock. As you can see, it's a perfect little square. You can see each little post, but you see a lot of the waves on top of the water. That tells you it's angled too high. Now, when it's angled too high, you can still see detail, but you're going to get a lot of that wave action. Now, this is a transducer that's angled properly. Look at how beautiful that dock shows up. That is perfect. And what I love about this image is, if you look inside those docks, you can see each little pylon. You're going to see a really nice bass swimming in here from the left. And he's going to swim right up through the middle of that dock. Now, that is where the beauty and perspective mode lies. It's amazing, the detail. Right here, you're going to see the dock. See how beautiful that dock shows up? Now, watch this fish swim in there. There he comes, swimming right up under the dock. That is a big old bass. And that right there is only done by having the proper angle uh, for your perspective mode mount. Okay, guys, in this section, this is where we're really getting into it. We're finna start learning some really valuable information. One of the hardest things to do is to make an adjustment on your unit and know what you're adjusting. So many times people, you know, they wanna know the, uh, what are your settings, what are your settings, and what are you adjusting? I find it better if you make an adjustment to know what you're adjusting. I mean, just you just don't go turning up the gain or turning down the gain or adjusting the TVG or the ghost tree uh, or the noise reduction. You want to know uh, color gain, color limit. You want to know what you're adjusting and how it affects the picture. 
those are very important. That way, if you make an adjustment and it doesn't do what you want, you'll know where to go back to, start over, and if you know if you're seeing lots of fuzz on the screen, you'll be able to go say, hey, that right there can be eliminated in a couple different ways. Let's try those ways. By knowing what your adjustments do, you'll be able to better dial in your unit and that right there is gonna give you the clearest possible picture, but give you the most detail at the same time because that's what you're doing. You're walking that fine line of detail versus clarity. And by knowing what each adjustment does and each setting does, you'll be able to better dial in that unit. So let's dig into this and let's go through each one of them slowly, but let's go through them thoroughly. That way you'll know exactly what you're doing when you make an adjustment. All right, guys, in this section, let's talk about gain. What is gain? In order to make good adjustments, uh, when you make adjustments on your uh, fish finder, it's important to know what each adjustment is. So let's start with gain. What is gain? Gain is simply Garmin's word for sensitivity. And in the following video, you'll see how each adjustment in game affects your picture. In this video, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through each adjustment in game. It'll be listed on the screen and to show you how much uh, adjusting game does. This is 50% gain. As you can see, I've lost all, there is no ghost tree, there are no artifacts in the water. Uh, but it doesn't show any detail. I mean, you got a tree out there about 28 feet and it just doesn't show up in that much. So here I am, I bumped it up to about 55 game, starting to see a few bait fish in the water at about six foot depth, out to about 25 feet, the tree starting to show up, even starting to see some white perch at the bottom of that tree right there. And that's what we're looking for. But I like it a little bit more. So let's go ahead and make some more adjustments. Here's 60% gain. Now look at those bait fish start to show up. And now you can start to see the white perch hiding in the trees. And even some bait fish right below the boat. Um, this was a real windy day. So I was trying my best to stay on this while I was filming it. Now here we are bumping it up to 65, which is real close to what I consider optimal. But look at those large balls of bait fish starting to show up. You got the detail, but if you look up in the top left-hand corner of the screen, you're starting to see that... Um, um, the ghost tree, I guess what people call it, but that's not really ghost tree, but a lot of the artifacts in the water. Now we're up to 70% and now 75 and you can see it's starting to blow the screen out um, and the ghost tree is really taking effect. It starts at about 22 feet out and curves all the way down to about 10 feet. Uh, you can still see fish and game fish in there, uh, but it, you know, it's just not optimal. So I'm going to back it down to about uh, 68 or so. What I feel is optimal for me on this body of water. It could be different on yours because I like to see the detail in the water. All right. Now we're going to move to TVG. Time, very game. What does TVG do? TVG stabilizes the returns on your unit. Now, what does that mean? What that means is, for example, if a fish up high in the water column, the return will naturally be stronger because of the shorter distance between the transducer as it hits the fish and comes back. Well, as it gets into deeper water, that time takes longer. And so the return will be weaker. TVG stabilizes and equalizes those returns. So a one pound fish looks like a one pound fish, whether it's high in the water column or low in the wall of column. So let's take a look. All right, let's 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 go straight into TVG. Time varying gain. Uh, it'll be under your sonar setup menu. Uh, pretty easy to get to. And there you go. It's TVG. Right now we have it at off. Now, as we talked about right at the beginning, knowing what TVG does uh, will help you make these adjustments better. Um, the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to turn it all the way on high. Now, remember one thing. It is a computer filtering out. It doesn't know that a jig is a jig, uh, particles in the water. It doesn't know that. It can't distinguish between it. It's doing simply what you've been told to do. 
So if you tell it to filter out at the highest rate possible, it's going to start filtering out everything. And it's kind of like noise redu reduction. Too much, too much of a good thing. You know what I mean? So what I like to do is, and I'm going to show you what medium and the low also does. Low is my preferred setting. Low helps clear up that upper left-hand corner window. But also what it does is it still allows your jig to show up. Now, you, you know, by understanding that, you know, returns at the top of the water column are always going to be stronger than turns at, returns at the bottom of the water column. And knowing that TVG equalizes those returns, then you'll, then you'll understand what your adjustments you're actually trying to make. The reason it clears the screen up so much when you put it on, you know, say high or medium, something like that, is because it's try, it's, you're telling it that a one pound fish is severely showing up large and almost not showing up at all. So it's going to really start filtering out those really small particles and making them, it's not filtering as much as it's trying to equalize and make small particles at the top look like small particles at the bottom and so forth. So it actually looks like it's filtering the screen when in effect it's just equalizing the returns and you're telling it how much equalization it needs. I have found that, for example, right now it's off and I'm going to put it on low right here and look, look at that. Look how beautiful low cleans that picture up. Not too much, but still enough that you can still see a, a 30 second ounce jig. Now, when you get to medium, notice how everything kind of went black. Those small particles could be your jig in certain situations. And then high just filters out everything. It actually starts to filter out part of the, the bush that's, that's down at the bottom right here. And when you start to filter out part of your bush, you absolutely know that it's going to filter out your jig so always be looking for you want to use on any adjustment the minimum that you can get away with and that's going to create your best picture now i have done this with the lvs 32 and the lvs 34 and they both seem to be very close in the adjustments they make so if you have the lvs 34 and you have the lvs 32 i still recommend tvg low but you still might want to take a look at medium or high throw you know drop a jig down there and then get a feel for what you're seeing you know so you know when you have it on high that's a lot you know so, okay see now here i have a jig put down you can see the braided line now notice when i turned it off that jig came back out of nowhere. So, all right, so we're going to go through each of these. I put it on low, the jig and the weight above it is still visible, but what did it kind of start to filter out was that braided line. Now, when you put it on medium, you'll see the bait, actually the weight above the bait starts to be, it starts to be filtered out, the line completely gone. All you're seeing now is the weight in the jig, and that may be right for you, but when you turn it on high, you see how it actually starts to filter out the bait and the weight. You can forget about seeing the braided line. That's not possible. But, and if you turn it all the way off, now you start to see, um, you're actually seeing some of the oxygen bubbles from the line moving through the water. See, that, that's, that's a little bit too much, and that really starts to cloud your screen up. So, I, my opinion, low is the perfect medium. All right, guys, in this section right here, what we're going to talk about is the ghost tree. Now, the ghost tree, as we've, uh, as I've explained before, the ghost tree is simply the beams bouncing off a hard surface, which will be the bottom, and bouncing back at an angle. It's almost impossible to completely eliminate this. Um, and what causes the ghost tree is one beam comes and bounces up, Another beam, and there are five beams, bounces and hits the bottom at a different angle and bounces away at a different angle. And that stair-step effect of all five beams bouncing creates what some people have called a tree or the ghost tree. The tree is not there, but it shows up on your screen as kind of a ghost tree. Um, it's been there from the beginning. I know there's a lot of people that will say, I didn't have this before the perspective mode update. 
you can actually go back and look at some of the first Garmin ads and see the resemblance of that ghost tree. But they tried to come out with a fix for it. Um, so many people griped and complained about it. I don't go crazy worrying about it. It doesn't really bother me because I know what it is. It only seems to happen in uh, shallow water. The deeper the water, the more it's eliminated because those beams go down, they have further bounce back. So it happens a lot in shallower water. But they came up with a fix called the Ghost Tree Reject. And it's, it, it's low, medium, high. You have off, low, medium, high. And then you have auto. Now I have tried all of these. And the best way to say it is I, I, I just do not like it. I don't want the computer um, trying to eliminate things on the screen because it can't decipher between a bait and interference so let's take a look at it let's see what it actually does and then you'll be able to take you know judge for yourself whether or not you want to use it i personally do not use it i'm not a big fan of it never have been so let's take a look at it right now all right guys let's dive into this thing uh, what i'm trying to do is this is of course is the same brush pile one of my favorite brush piles uh I'm trying to make sure that I get a jig into the picture because when we're fishing, the, the jig being in the picture is important because a lot of people want to see their weight. I always put a weight above my jig. That way you can see it better. The ghost tree usually happens in that 20 foot circle around it. So, you know, that's, that's why where people white perch fish, do a lot of white perch fishing. And that's in that area where the ghost tree, the beams, um, they start to interact with you. You get returns starting to hit. You know, the beam's going out and it hits another beam and that's where that little, the ghost tree for, uh, I guess in lack of a better term, people have come to it because, because it looks like a tree come up with. So we started off on low. And you can, what they do is by turning, doing the ghost tree, they're taking some of the power and redirecting it from some of the down beams into more of the out beams and that is supposed to take it where they're not colliding and creating the beam what i have found by turning this on is it creates huge voids um as you can see right here you see the lower part of the beam and i say lower part from the about uh, straight under the boat out to about halfway see how it's black there um it's filtering out uh a lot of that the, the particles in the water not by a filtering process but because it's directing most of its power toward the forward beam so you got more power going toward forward beam and less going down look at the jig see how the line shows up about halfway down and then it starts to filter out or go away when it gets closer to the jig and the weight now uh I don't really want, I, if I'm going to get it to show up, I don't want half my screen being filtered and half of it not. And now we're going to turn this, actually we're going to go ahead and turn it all the way off. Now off is uh, no filtering. That's equal power to all the beams. And, and when you turn it to low, it directs a little bit more power toward the forward shooting beams and a little bit less. And you can see it in the picture. Look at halfway up. You see more interference or more noise in the water and then the lower portion less noise but look at look at that jig right there see that line showing up down to about the halfway point and then when it gets to the halfway point not as much uh the line's not showing up as well now this is as we turn it to medium really look at that now we're really starting jig still showing up well and but it's starting to really filter out now when you turn it to high this is where it gets crazy i don't know what it does on high because it's supposed to be redirecting the power toward the forward, but all it looks like to me is, is it takes 90% of the power and shoots it in that very top beam, which is literally aiming at the water surface and out. So, and then the other parts doesn't have any kind of return at all. Me personally, I hate it. I, th I turn it off and I use the noise reject and the TVG to control my picture. All right, now let's take a look at noise control. Now, noise control, what you're asking the fish finder to do is to filter out 
small returns or noise in the water. Um, that noise can come from uh, trolling motors, electronics, and things like that. But remember, as you're using noise control, which is very useful, you're also asking the unit to filter out some returns. Now, those returns could be your 32nd ounce crappie jig, or you know, it could be your spinner bait coming by a tree. So be careful in overusing the noise control feature because you don't want to go too far and then to start to filter out the things that you really want to see. All right, we're going to start with the noise in off position, and now we're turning it to high. The reason I wanted you to see high is to see how much it clears it up. Now, one thing that about high is, to me, it makes the movements real milky. Now, the screen is extremely clear. Now, we're going to go to low. Now, we're in very shallow water, so the effects of, of having it on low are going to be a little bit less than, say, normal. But I got to say that medium is looks like to be an excellent in-between. It, it, it's got a really nice, clear picture, but you don't have that super milky movement. And here we go again. I put it back on high where you can see it. See, the, the movement is real milky, almost like the fish and the bait fish are in molasses. And that is not, uh, to me, it does. it's not real natural and your bait movement won't be real natural. So um, high is not my choice. I'm more of a low to medium guy, just depending on how it looks on a particular day. Um, some days low looks really good and that has a lot to do with the particles in the water. And some days medium is your best choice. Now let's talk about color gain. Color gain is, is simply this. It is the brightness at which your uh, colors show up. So if you put it at 100 color gain, it will pop. It makes all your brightness on a, on a pretty much the same level. There's no uh, contrast to your uh, return. So the brighter you get it, yes, the fish will pop. The bait will pop. But you have to be cautious about this because you start to lose some of the detail and the fine detail. So if you got it on a hundred gain in a brush pile, you don't want that because then everything starts to blend together and pop together. So be careful with color gain. I say with crappie, you know, you may not want to use as much as you use with bass. So let's take a look at that. All right, color gain is simply controls how bright your returns show up on the screen. Gain is sensitivity. Color gain has a lot to do with how much a bait pops and things like that. Essentially showing the brightness on the screen. Now remember one thing. The brighter you set your color gain because it pops so much it kind of blows out. The more you're going to lose your detail because everything is beginning to be blown out. So there's a fine line that we walk when doing this. This is down there with color gain very, very low. Uh, you can still see the bait. You can still see the trees. But notice how everything is kind of dull. Uh, there's not a lot of vibrance in the screen and things like that. But what we're going to do, and that was on the color again at 2%. Now we're going to go up to about 50%. Notice the hues of the amber. They're a lot better, a little bit more vibrant color. Um, everything's still going to show up about the same. This is a kind of a default setting. Uh I don't use this. I want to go to the higher end of the spectrum. Now, notice the bait still showing up wonderful coming through there, but can be kind of hard to pick up. Now, I don't, I don't want to have to struggle to pick up my bait on the screen. So I have learned to go into the 80 to 100 range. Um, it is just kind of a thing that I've like, I've, I've grown to like, the brighter returns. Now, I don't want to go too high, especially crappie fishing. You don't want to go too high because, it, like I said, it'll blow out the pitcher. But right here, I'm throwing an A-rig. This is a bass situation. Notice the baits are popping. The, the fish are popping. The tree is popping. You can see a lot, but this is more open water. This is not fishing in cover and on all structure. You're, you're trying to see the bait. You're trying to see the fish, but look how beautiful that bait is coming back through the water. Now, but I've noticed, say, for crappie fishing, that I believe 80 is probably your best way. Um, 
And that being that it doesn't, you still get good pop from your bait and you still get good pop from the fish, but it doesn't blow out the picture and start to affect the target separation and the detail of the bush and things like that. So there's always a fine line and a happy medium. But I got to tell you, when you're out there throwing an A-rig in open water, you may want to jack that color gain up to 100% because that, that way you can get that fine detail. You can see I threw it three or four times out here. Look at those fish pop. Now, notice those the little bit of fuzz in the water. You can actually see the resemblance of a ghost tree. That's okay. There, you, you're not trying to get the perfectly clear picture. You're wanting to get all the detail. Look at the oxygen bubbles as I yank that bait back through the zone. So that's what we're looking for. That's what you're trying to attain. I would say that 80 is your best color gain color for crappie. And I would even creep to the 90 to 100 range for open water bass fishing. But then maybe stay in that 80 range for fishing, say, brush tops and things like that. Uh, even for bass. So 80 for, for structure and cover, open water, I'm going to use 90 to 100. That way you can make your bait pop and, you know, make the fish pop also. All right, color limit. Man, when it first came out, it was such a controversial addition to the Garmin units. Um, and if what they were trying to do was is find ways to clean up the picture. But I have always been one of the ones that says, I don't mind a little fuzz in order to see what I want to see. And as, as we've got a few updates away, I am got to the point where I don't even use color limit. Color limit, um, to me, I put it on zero, but you may want to use it. But essentially what color limit is doing is taking away, it's kind of like a color game, but it's taking away all your different hues of your colors and simply making them uh, black and white. And so by doing that, you filter you filter out uh, a lot of the particles in the water. Yes, the picture will get clearer, but man, you lose detail, you lose, uh, you lose the fine detail of being able to see the fine baits. I'm not a big fan of it and I don't use it very much. All right, now what color limit does is essentially takes away the hues of each color, essentially turning the screen to a black and white image. Now with color limit on zero, you're gonna see here lots of small bait fish. You can see fish swimming around. You can see the bait very cleanly come back to the boat. Um, I'm throwing an A-rig in this picture just to really show you that, man, when it comes in, you can literally see it splash there about 40 foot comes down you see a lot of fish in the water column you see the bait very good you can actually see separation between the front of the bait and actually swimming uh the swimming actual swim baits on it now that is what you're looking for that's why i use zero to this day but let's take a look at the other color limits that way you can decide for yourself what's the best so i'm going to turn the color limit to 50. now when you turn it to 50 not much changes um the screen, the background gets a little blacker because it's filtered out just a little bit of those lighter returns. The bottom got a little bit brighter because the bright returns got wider. Still see the bait coming there about 40 feet, reeling it through here. There's really nothing that, you know, in my opinion, I think there's better ways to filter the screen than using the color limit. Um, Alex said, I don't use it at all. You can still see the bubbles right there as I jank the bait up to make another cast. But now when we go to 100% color limit, what it does is it filters out anything that's not the strongest return, essentially making everything black and white. Now notice, very hard to see the bait hit the water. Very hard to catch it coming back. And even when it's coming back, it's blinking. That's because it's on the edge of the beam and those small or not as strong returns don't show up as bright and that is why it's blinking because if it's not in the center of the beam you're not going to see it on the screen all right guys in this section as we've dialed in we really know what all our settings are we know you know what the settings do when you adjust them but one of the things that can really help put your unit kind of over that over the hump of being just amazing and that is focus uh, when it comes from the factory 
it will come as auto fresh there are three different settings auto fresh auto salt and then you have a manual setting where you can adjust your focus now what is actual focus you have five beams and those beams don't always line up perfectly if you've ever looked at your bottom and seen kind of a stair step stagger where the bottom is not perfectly straight that means your beams are out of line so you can go into this feature um, into the focus feature and when you go in there you can adjust it up and down manually to perfectly align it now by perfectly aligning it you're going to assure that your rays are not overlapping or anything like that and by not overlapping you'll help reduce the uh the ghost tree effect as much as you possibly can and you're going to get a clean cleaner crisper picture so let's take a look at that right now it's a great feature and something a lot of people don't even know about all right guys Th this particular thing is called focus now focus it comes on auto fresh or auto salt depending on where you set this up this is something that I suggest to you do to fine tune your uh, live scope as good as possible. Uh, there have been a few that I have turned on as I'm doing my lessons where I've seen the focus is perfect, but not many. But what we do is along the bottom of the screen, this is where your focus comes in. You have five different beams and they're aimed downwards. Now what you're doing by your Focusing is you're actually changing the direction of those beams just slightly so they line up better. On my particular unit, about 145 is absolutely perfect. You notice there's not, not any seams or uh, beam stitching areas where the bottom is, or at least as best as I can possibly do it. But when you move it to zero or all the way up, you know, to the very top, to up to about 255, you'll notice that the, the beam stitching areas will begin to be staggered. Um, they will begin to, you know, overlay each other a little bit. And when you do that, you're not going to get the best picture. And it's also going to amplify your ghost tree return. So we're going to take a look as we're going through this. And, you, and it, you know, it's very important that this is a fine, fine tuning. It's not... The, it's not going to, you know, you know, fix everything. Now, notice as I dropped it to zero, it's going to, we're going to go from one extreme to the other, and then we're going to go to 255. Notice how those beam stitched areas are not even, they're not perfect. And so what I suggest you do is get out in deep water, get out in deep water where you've got a very, it's, the wind's not blowing and you've got a very good lock on the bottom and then slowly adjust your focus back and forth until you get a perfectly clean and perfectly straight bottom where all the beams line up perfectly. Now, some people's, like I said, I've had a few where auto fresh or auto salt was money and, you know, they lined up perfectly. But that has not been the case on most every single unit that I have um that I've ever tested with or have been on the water doing classes. But you notice as I move it from zero to 255, notice that those beams changing the angle in which they're lining up. And that's what you're doing. You're trying to get the perfect lineup. And when you get it perfectly tuned, that's going to help. First of all, it's going to help with dead spots. And then secondly, it's going to help with the ghost tree because if we know a ghost tree is simply a reflection of one of the beams, it's hitting a hard bottom and reflecting up at an angle. And so if you can make sure that your beams are perfect, that will eliminate it. Now let's talk about how I set my depth. Um, I, for forever and ever, the consensus was to take your depth, add about three feet to the bottom. Say if you're in 20 foot of water, put the depth on 23. That way you maximize your screen. Well, after a lot of research and a lot of uh, on the water testing, um, and I didn't come up with this on it's I, my own. I've, I've, I've looked at a bunch of different videos and I've watched and spent a lot of time on the water. And I will say this, I take the depth and I add about 10 foot. So let's get into that and we'll talk about why I do that. But I 
and just uh, of the belief that it creates a better picture. All right, let's get into this because forever and ever when you first chose depth, I mean, uh, it's how I was taught. Everybody always said, take your depth, whatever that may be, and in this case, about 11 foot, you would set it on, say, 14 foot. Add about two to three foot, and that would maximize your screen. Well, one thing we have found through time, or at least I have, and seen from other some of the best uh, forward-facing sonar anglers in the world is that that's not necessarily the best way. The live scope transducer is a chirp style transducer and it gives power based on the depth in which you, it thinks you're in. For example, if you tell it you're in 14 foot of water, it'll give you 14 foot of, uh, of power. It gives you the amount of power that it needs, that it thinks it needs to make a, uh, you know, a good picture. But what I have found, and this is not only, this is not only my idea. I've seen this and, and, and in one angler in particular, uh, he uses it to the, uh, you know, the best of the degree is to take your depth and add about 10 feet. Now this will cut down on your screen size. But one thing that I have noticed by cutting down on your screen size is you're, you're giving, you're asking the unit, for example, if you're in 11 foot of water, you're telling the wood unit you're in 21 foot of water, so it's going to give more power. Now, by giving more power, you're going to get better detail, better target separation, and a cleaner picture. Um, that is something that we're all striving for. Now, when you... You, for example, as I go up and down, the the particles in the water will appear. It gets a lot fuzzier. The screen gets a lot fuzzier. But secondly, it also blows the screen out. If you're an 11 foot and you put it on 13, everything looks big and blown out. By putting it <clears throat> on 11 foot, you know, if you're an 11 foot of water, putting it on about 20, 21 foot depth, what it does is it's going to clean the picture up. The fuzz will kind of clean up. <clears throat> by two ways it's making it smaller on the screen but you're also increasing the power which will help kind of blast through the 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 algae and things in the water so it's kind of a a two-way door you get you you actually gain two things by doing this and then i have noticed that not only do i get better detail with my jigs and my baits and the fish will actually get better detail i'm gonna get better target separation around uh, say trees and brush piles and things like that. Um, as you'll see, as I'm going down, notice how that bottom got fuzzier and it get, you know, it just, it wasn't as crisp, but then when you go up, that bottom's a lot, lot more crisp. You can actually see a fish at about 26 foot right here swimming. You can actually see the swimming action of the fish. And then when you put that down to say, you know, two or three feet below the surface, you can still see the fish, but look at the bottom. Look how it's not as crisp. Look, it's fuzzier. Uh, you also notice the particles in the water appear more. Um, and I have just found that it's better. Now, even, you know, I used to think that this was only a, for a bass fishing thing. But over time, I have found it to be an everything thing. Um, it, it just it creates a better picture, and that has a lot to do with the chirp style transducer and i know you're going to give up a little bit of your your screen size but trust me what you give up in screen size is well worth the advantages that you're going to gain uh in detail target separation and crispness of your picture and by doing that that way you can actually take color gain and noise reduction reduction tvg and use those to clean up your picture even more Guys, in this section, um, we have went over everything else. We've learned what settings are. We've learned what each settings do. In this specific chapter, I'm going to do two things. And I'm going to limit this to crappie and bass. Bass can be substituted with walleye, uh, pike, or ever how you want to do it. And the crappie can be substituted with brim. But we're going to use crappie and bass because they're the most, um, you, you know, fish for species. These are the baseline settings 
for those particular species. And I'm going to put a, a, a graphic up on the screen for these. That way you could have you a little something to look at. When I am crappie fishing, okay, I, I, do, I do a few things. I'm going to put my gain on about 68. I'm going to put my ghost tree off. I'm going to put my noise control on low. Um, and the reason is because I want as, li as little amount of computer filtering as possible. I'm not worried about a perfectly clear screen. I'm more worried about seeing the fine detail of the small baits and being able to see those movements. If you turn the noise control up too high, the, the fluid, the movements of the fish and the bait become real glitchy. So I use low, that's a maximum. Um, TVG, low. Uh, I don't turn it, I don't, it helps clear up the left hand portion of the screen, especially for crappie fishing, this is amazing. And it also stabilizes the return. Therefore, when a fish is one pound at the surface, he'll look like he's one pound on the bottom. Without TVG on, which is time very game, a one pounder will look smaller on the bottom than he does on the, the top due to the amount of time it takes for the, the return to come back to the transducer. And therefore, it will look smaller. But if you turn the TVG on low, it'll stabilize that image a little bit, stabilize those readings, make them equal, which is what you want to do. Therefore, you can target the biggest fish, especially crappie fishing. Now, appearance-wise, when we go into the appearance menu, um, I don't use my color game, but about 80. I, I tend to be a little bit lower than I do bass fishing for the simple reason it helps me get a little bit better fine detail and target separation. The higher the gain, you start to blow out a little bit. Uh, fish will pop better, but you lose that little bit of fine detail. So there's always a trade-off. Color limit, zero. Never going to use it. Don't want it. Don't give me none of it. Now, in terms of depth and forward distance, you may search on 50, 60 foot while you're looking for brush piles or trees. But when I'm actually fishing, I go no more than 30 feet. Period. Don't go any difference. Now, the depth wise, this is where a lot of people disagree, but the method I use is I take the depth and add 10 feet. Now I know that's not maximizing your screen, but the reason I do that is because this live scope transducer is a chirp style transducer. Therefore, it gives you power based on the depth that it thinks it's in. So if you fool it by giving it, saying it's in 10 foot deeper water, it's gonna give you a little bit more power a little bit more power equals a little bit better target separation and that's what we're all looking for so those are the settings that I use those are the ones that I do not usually I don't change them much I'm once I get it dialed in with those settings I'm pretty that's it you know I don't go too far in those things I don't use grid lines at all some people do them that's a personal preference thing I'm not a big grid line guy but that's a personal preference thing. I don't like the beam icon in the top right-hand corner of the screen. I think it's a worthless, worthless thing that Garmin's put on there. It used to be a little bit better when they had the boat icon, but even that wasn't accurate. But now let's switch over to bass settings. And uh, this is what I tend to do about 80% of the time. Um, bass settings are a lot different, a lot different because you got two modes that you like to use. So first, let's go over the forward settings. Forward settings, um, 68 gain. It's my money in the bank. It's hard to beat. Same thing again with noise control, low. TVG, low. Ghost, uh, the ghost tree, uh, off. Don't like it. Uh, get into appearance. Color gain, I like to use a little bit higher. Not the 80. I tend to, temp to, to go toward the 90, 100 because I'm using it more, a little bit more open water, using bigger fish. So I don't mind the fine detail. I'm trying to see the bait and the fish pop. Very important there. Color limit, zero. Don't use it, don't need it, haven't seen the need for it in a long time. Whatever they did with it at first, it's not the same anymore. It doesn't do anything. So those are the settings. Now, depth-wise, once again, always 10 foot more than the bottom depth. Um, that goes back to the chirp style transducer. And that's very important that we know this. Now, forward, I know a lot of people use 80, 90, 100, and that is more for the guys who are very experienced and they're out there hunting bass, uh, you know, over in Texas when they're really hunting bass in open water. But me, I use 60 maximum and I tend to go even down to 50 and 40 if I'm targeting cypress trees 
or dock pylons and things like that or bridge pylons where I can see the target very clearly and I want to make good solid accurate cast. Now when you flip it over into perspective mode which I use uh, a lot probably 60% of the time I'm using live scope for bass so I'm using it quite a bit. I will always do two things make sure I have the angle proper and we talk about angle in another section but the one thing that I do is I always lower my gain down about 10 percentage points. So if I'm at 68, I drop to about 58 to 60. That what that does is that helps weaken the bottom return and makes your fish and your structure pop a little bit more. Really, when you're in perspective mode, I'm trying to see the fish. It makes it pop a little bit more. But these are my baseline settings. They're not the end-all be-all, but they're pretty dang good settings to get you going and get you in the right direction. And with the understanding that we've talked about in another chapter about understanding what each adjustment does, it ought to get you dialed in, guys. And I hope this right here helps you catch more fish. All right, guys, in this section, we're gonna talk about how do I choose forward mode versus perspective mode? How do you choose that? How do you know which one to use? Well, what I do is I follow a few simple rules to narrow it down, and therefore, it helps kind of uh, understand what you're doing and helps you choose better modes. One of the things I use is when, for example, if I'm fishing uh, bottom hugging baits, uh, bottom hugging baits being worms and things like that um, where depth is not an important important feature where I don't know I'm, I'm throwing a bait that's on the bottom I'm hugging the bottom I'm going to use perspective mode because I know where the bait's at I know where I think the fish are so I'm going to use the mode where I can really scan large areas and really look around and see those individual fish um, so bottom hugging style bait, baits, I'm gonna use those. If I'm using a depth uh, specific bait, say a crank bait, a spinner bait, uh, if I'm using, for example, a jerk bait or an A-rig, I tend to go toward forward mode more because I really wanna make sure that I'm accurately on the depth the fish are. So when I'm using, a, uh, for example, throwing an A-rig, you wouldn't want to use perspective mode because you could go under or over him and you would never know. That's why you use forward mode. Make sure you get your bait on the right level and get it above his head where it would where it works the best. Uh, jerk baits. Um, I want to use a jerk bait because it's it's a it's a specific depth bait. I'm going to use forward mode. I want to make sure that I'm on the perfect level. Spinner baits, same thing. Um, but. For example, when I'm using, say, big swim baits where, you know, you're reeling them slow, it's not about the depth, it's about the bait or big uh, glide baits, that's when I use perspective mode. So bottom hugging baits and baits where the depth of the bait pretty much remains static, you're reeling them real slow, they're not changing much, that's when I'm going to use perspective mode. Those are baits where I want to make sure and see if fish are following my baits, see if fish come off of trees or come out of brush piles or come off of, uh, uh, say, uh, dock pylons or bridge pylons. When I want to see if those fish are following the bait, that way I'll know if there's actually fish on it and those type of deals. That's where I want to use perspective mode. Now, a few of the, my favorite baits for each mode, I figured I'd throw this in because it's a little bonus. Let's go perspective mode. Big swim baits, worms. I know it sounds a little different than some of the other people's thinking, but worms, big worms, bottom hugging worms, glide baits, those type of deals. Those are the three or four baits that I would use on perspective mode. Um, even square bill crankbaits where that depth is very static, it stays the same type deal. That's something that, oh, whoa, whoa, that stays the same. Now, forward mode, I'm gonna use A rigs things like that. A spinner bait, which the depth can vary depending on the weight and the retrieve uh, ratio. Jerk baits, um, different jerk baits go to different depths. 
um, that's a big deal. Or if I'm fishing brush piles, say deep brush piles, where I'm throwing a crankbait and I want to make sure that I'm just coming over the top and not burying it into that crank into that heel, that's where I'll use uh, the forward mode. But guys, I, this is where we're really getting technical. We're really taking all we learned and starting to really break it down and choose what's best to attack the fish that we're after. So I hope you enjoyed this section. And when you put it together with all the other sections, man, it's going to make you dynamite on the water. Now let's take a look at color palettes. Um, you know, there, there's... I think there's about 15 different color palettes. And then you have the two hidden gems when you use the nighttime color portion. Uh, that's on blue and yellow. So a total of 17 different color palettes. Now, one thing you need to know is that using different color palettes, and, and a lot of them are very useful, are, does different things to your picture. And so by going through and experimenting, finding your favorite color palette, one that fits your eye, and uh, one that also will assist you in you know, catching more fish because each does different things. Each will highlight something different. So let's take a look at that also. Now, the first thing we need to notice <clears throat> is that I'm not going to change any settings. Uh, this is a big tree fell down. Uh, it's got some crappie in it. Um, it's a spot that I fish often. Um, but... I want you to notice, I'm going to go through each and every one. I'm not going to call out uh, every name of every color palette. It's, uh, it's visible in the top right-hand corner. But what I want you to pay attention and notice is, first of all, the artifacts coming out. That's number one, uh, to, to, to notice how the artifacts change. Secondly, I want you to notice how the detail of the tree changes. Um, and then thirdly, I want you to notice how the target separation changes. Some of these allow better visibility in daylight hours. Um, some of them are better for nighttime hours. I would say, for example, ice blue, very good on the eyes. Um, it's, it's great for nighttime view, but it doesn't have a lot of contrast. Um, there, you know, there's, you know, aqua would be great on the eyes and, you know, but once again, not a lot of contrast and target separation. Now, moss, which is my absolute favorite for daytime, great brightness, uh, everything pops, but you lose a little detail. You know, so everything has its, uh, you know, pluses and minuses. Uh, amber, to me, still by far the best color ever made for live scope. Uh, you have great target separation. You're going to get the best detail you could possibly find. Copper's not bad, but once again, that's another one of those ones that doesn't, um, <clears throat> you know, it doesn't have the the great target separation and things like that. But black emerald, that was one of the first ones they always talked about for sunlight. But I want you to notice those artifacts. Look how much more they appear. Um, it's a lot. The screen gets a lot busier. Um, things show up. Now look, the settings have never changed. We're just changing the color palette, which changing the color palette uh, highlights certain things and and then, uh, you know, makes certain things pop that normally wouldn't always pop. Orange crawfish is one of the best for open water A-rig fishing and because of just, it, it, the baits really show up well. I mean, no doubt. Uh, red shad. That's another great color, but, and you'll notice there, it, it does show some, you know, you don't really get a lot of detail, but you do get some great target separation in red shad. Uh, that's a color you might want to look at. But my, my third favorite color other than moss and amber is blue. Now, blue, you're not going to have a lot of detail, but man, does it make uh, fish pop because of that red intensity showing up. You'll be able to pick larger fish out than normal. Now, the daytime yellow color, which is, um, this is actually a nighttime yellow color right here. I, I tend to stick to the nighttime yellow color, uh, color patterns. Blue and yellow have a different background. But I'm going to tell you, yellow on the nighttime color palette is pretty daggum good. They're pretty, pretty awesome. But when you put it on the daytime color palette, 
It is not one of my favorites. I do not like that white background. It reminds me of the very first uh, pen optics that came out and it was not good at all. So what you need to do is go through each of these color palettes and see which one fits your eye number one first and just see which one shows the detail and shows you what you're looking for because there are just tons and tons of color patterns. I mean, we're talking about 15 plus the two nighttime. You know, you're talking about almost 17 color palettes. There's got to be one in there that will show what you're wanting to see and help you catch more fish because that's what we're all about is trying to catch more fish. And when you catch more fish, you know, you've had a great day on the water and you feel like you're getting your most out of your live scope. Guys, one thing that I get asked constantly, 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 what's your favorite colors and why? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up in the top of the screen, probably put it right there where my hand's at. I'm going to put that right there. And as we talk about it, I'm going to let you know what my favorite. But I'm going to start with the first one is probably everybody's go-to favorite because it's the original. Live scope is amber. Amber is a great color. It's probably the cleanest picture out there. It's real clean. It's easy to adjust. And the reason is because of the amber blends with the background. So you lose a lot of your, your little fuzz that's in the water. Uh, that's, that's the properties of that color. Now, it's a great color for early in the morning or cloudy weather. That's okay. Today's got a decently cloud. I can see it. But I'm also colorblind, as are a lot of men. Uh, matter of fact, only men are colorblind. Cool fact that you didn't know. Uh, women cannot be colorblind. I don't know why that is. It's just what my optometrist told me. But... Uh, men are colorblind, a lot of men are colorblind, or some sort. And so that amber, as the sun pops out, or you're wearing your polarized glasses, begins to blend. You start to lose your bait, you start to lose things like that. So, let's take the amber, get it out of here. Bring it in this one. It's sunny. This is my favorite for sunny. Now, I want to tell you something with this. Amber shows the most detail. This one right here, moss shows less detail because of the brightness of it and the way it just the properties of the color but it shows up beautifully in sunshine so you have to use your imagination a little bit more because you can't get the you can't get the details of a cypress tree or a grass flat or many of those things that you can get uh with amber you have to use your imagination a little more it's just play it the way it goes but it's brighter you can see your bait and things like that that is why amber in the middle of the sun uh uh, for example, if I'm fishing trees and or, or fishing stumps or uh, the tops of grass, I want to use that moss. Moss is the color. I want to use that moss. Amber fades away. As sun, but moss is that color. It has popping. It pops out there, and it uh, helps show your bait. Lose a little detail though. So, but that's my second favorite color when the sun's out, getting out there like this, and you got polarized glass on. Moss is my go-to. But look, let's get it get it out of here there we go thirdly this is my favorite color it, it may be my favorite color for nighttime early in the morning late in the evening heck it may be my favorite color all the way sometimes uh, and i tend to use it less and less the detail you lose way you lose pretty much all your detail you just got to see the resemblance of trees you see trees but you don't understand the trees because it's hard to picture it and that is blue put it up there right there blue it's up there i know it's up there because i put it up there Wait a minute, it's not up there? Okay, it's up there now. Blue. Blue is my favorite. Um, when it comes to low light situations or I don't need to see as much detail. Uh, let's say, for example, I'm fishing a, a brush top. And I'm not trying to see if the crop you're in the brush top. I'm just trying to see the brush top and they're all around it. Or a big log. Uh, you've seen those before in some of my videos. Um, it helps with a few certain things that make it really awesome. Blue, if you see a fish and he has a strong return, he'll have a real red core. Smaller fish won't have that. They'll have kind of a yellowish tint to it, and uh, big fish will have a strong red core, that strong return. Now, that is amazing, especially for tournament fishermen, because you can target those bigger fish. In a brush pile, you can look down there and you can see the two or three big fish in the brush pile, and you can put your bait on, especially if you're using 
uh, lead head with a little weight above it, that even your bait, your weight will be very strong and very uh, out there. Um, if you're throwing an A-rig over grass, your A-rig is, I mean, it pops, and so does the big fish that you're after popping. So that is uh, my favorite color for low light situations, but it's becoming one of my favorite to use all the time. See, I don't have a problem using different colors. I, don't, I might not have a problem using amber, moss, or blue all in one day. Because you know why? I'm not afraid to try things and fail. I'm not afraid to say things and research it and do things like that. That's why I feel like, uh, not bragging, but I feel like I'm one of the better live scope fishermen in terms of trying things. I may not be the best fisherman out there. I'm not. There's people kicking my tail all over the water. Heck, I retired from tournaments because I got tired of my brains beating it. But I, I'm a good live scope fisherman. I know how to get a good picture. I know how to use it to my advantages. And it's made me a better fisherman because I know my style. And now I know how to use all the tools within live scope to fit my style. All right, guys, in a little Louisiana Light Me Up, a little something extra. I'm going to show you two hidden color palettes that you may love. And they're awesome additions to the 15 other color palettes available already. Let's go. Let's get straight into it. The first thing I like to do, the only two color palettes that it changes is blue and yellow. So we're going to go ahead and switch it to blue here. Uh, that's under your appearance uh, tab. When you switch it to blue... Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to push the power button. Now, when you push the power button, it's going to bring up an option right here. And what that option is, is, is to be able to change the color, uh, the brightness, and also to change the color mode. There's a lot of different things you can do there. But we're going to go into color mode, and we're going to choose night colors. Now we're going to go back. Now, I want you to watch that blue change. Now, look, it went from a light blue to like a dark midnight blue. I love that. I tell you what, that is an awesome thing for me. I tell you what, blue I already love. Now it is amazing. But the other color that it changes is yellow. Yeah, uh, Yellow was always an, an unusable uh, color palette to me. I hated it. And the reason I hated it is right here, I'm going to go back and show it to you in the daytime color scheme, is that white, bright white. It just felt like it looked like the old pan optics. I didn't like it. But when you switch it over to nighttime colors, it's a usable thing. Now, you'll need to do a little adjusting on your gain and things like that. But being able to do that, I think you'll love it. Blue and yellow, new color pattern. All right, guys. In this section, let's talk about grids. Now, I'm not a huge fan of grids, but one place I'm a huge fan of a grid is in the perspective mode and radial grid overlay. Let's take a look at that right now. All right. This is an awesome, awesome feature. I'm not a huge fan of the grid overlay, but when I was rolling through, just kind of look at the grid, I found an awesome new feature called radial grid overlay. And what that does is, is it gives the, the grid in degrees. Now, this is going to greatly help you be able to cast in the accurate because when we're using the uh, perspective mode, it is a target-oriented cast. So go into your menu, menu, perspective menu, go to sonar setup, and there it is, grid overlay. When you turn on the grid overlay, you got two options. You got your radial grid. And you have your, there's your square grid, the one we've always used. Um, that really serves no purpose in this one. But if you go into the sonar setup again, go into layout, and go into grid overlay, there it is, radial uh, overlay. Now what that does is that creates a curved and gives you angles, 15 degrees, 30 degrees, 45 degrees, 60 degrees, all the way out to 75 now, that'll allow you to line your rod if you'll stand directly over the top of your unit and take your rod. Like, see, if you see something out at 30 degrees, you can stand directly over the unit, make sure it's lined up with the, the error indicator, point your rod right along that deal, and you can make a perfect cast and line it up 
And that's the old, like I said, the Brandon Polynook trick where he lines it up. So if you see a stump out there at 30 degrees, line your rod up on that 30 degrees, make the cast. You hit it almost every time. I think it's an awesome, awesome feature. Um, I've been using it the last few time, trips out. I just really found the, the uh, feature on there. Uh, I think it's really, really awesome. I think you should try it. Give it a shot. And there's one more little feature in this layout deal. You can turn the beam icon off, off and on. That's up in the top right-hand corner. I didn't leave mine on uh, just because I want to make sure my beam is set at the right angle. But that's in the same deal. You go to Sonar Setup, go to Layout, and you can turn it on and off. But, guys, thank you know, hey, this thing's getting pretty big, and I'm proud of it. Don't forget the giveaway at the end of this month. Right, guys let's take a look at reverse range a very very useful tool reverse range is an amazing feature that can be used for crappie and bass fishing let's dive right in let's get straight into this a very useful tool reverse range is you want to go into your options menu um, go into sonar setup you'll go into layout and you'll go right down to reverse range there's four different options in reverse range um, right now it's on the default and if you change it to hide this is a normal what I use for bass fishing uh, things like that and then you have your minimum which is just a little bit of backwards view um, just looking a little bit behind the boat um, then you'll have uh, default which is the what came with the units and it was actually what was on the units well before we had the option to change reverse range uh, reverse range has become a very useful tool, um, but this is how you move your zero. And then if you go full, um, it really, really allows you to see well back beyond the boat. Now, notice and, and note that nothing is really changing here except for they're moving the zero. Nothing is changing with beam angles or anything like that. It's just the screen. They're shifting the screen to the left or the right depending on what you choose so nothing is nothing is changing in terms of settings or anything like that this is just simply you moving the zero on the screen um there we go see all i did was slide the zero to the left and that's you hiding the reverse range at all very useful it's a very uh efficient tool for helping you choose it based on the species you're using but guys, I want to remind you to stay t tuned at the very end of this to uh, check out a really cool fish, uh, fishing video. Just a real short clip with the new camera. Tell me what you All right, guys. From time to time, you will have to update your unit. Uh, whether it be bugs that, it, that uh, develop or, you know, just upgrading for new software to make your units run better. And when you do that, there is a couple special steps that you need to take. So what I've done is I've actually got onto the computer. This one was a little bit harder to film. It doesn't look quite as professional as the rest of it does. But this is something that you're gonna have to do from time to time. So I'm gonna show you the process to abstract the update off of the computer using Garmin's own marine website. You'll be able to go onto there, download the unit uh, unit's update, stick the unit uh, stick the card into your unit it will update automatically and uh, you'll just follow the on-screen prompts but let's go let's get into this take a look at it and this will help you update your unit and what you're going to have to do from time to time let's take a look at this right now all right guys go to google type in garmin marine updates and when you do this will pop up you'll click on the first one right here it's going to take you straight to Garmin's page. Now, at the very top, it says Marine Device Software Updates. You can look and see what's new right here where the air is at. You can view what's in past updates or stuff like that. But scroll down to the bottom where it says Download Updates Manually. Now, when you click that, it'll bring up um, the updates. You just kind of scroll down, find out which one you are. If you're Echo Map, you'll say it says see all devices in this bundle download or you can buy now and that's where you can purchase a car and get it shipped to your house but for me the gps map series um i do know mine's a 1022 so it's right there right there where i'm highlighting and now i'm going to scroll over to download 
very simple, but here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna click download and it gives you this right here and you have to agree to it. All right, I'm gonna agree to the terms. Now, when this happens, I'm gonna shut the computer off because we're not gonna sit here and wait on a five gigabyte. Um, you, I've already actually downloaded it, so we'll skip this part. But if you'll click download right down here, it will download and you'll see a percentage, but it's a five gig update. So I'm not gonna click uh, download at this point in time. We're going to <coughs> assume that it's already downloaded. That'll save a little time and I won't have to download something twice to the computer. But I'm gonna turn the computer off. I mean, the camera off, I'm gonna go to the next step. All right, after it's downloaded, you'll go to the download section right over here. I have it highlighted. And you'll be able to see that I downloaded it on Fort 13 at 8, 11 a.m. You'll go up to this right here. Now, it's different than it was before. When you click on it, I'm gonna double click. Okay, it doesn't have anything. It just says Garmin, like right there. What you do is you go right here to extract all. It's right here at the top, and I'm gonna highlight it with my pointer. Extract all. You'll click on extract all. Now, it's gonna bring up something, uh, and you're, what you're doing is you're extracting or unzipping the folders. You'll go to browse, click browse, find your card drive. My card drive is SD, is a G, it's already in there. And when you click that, you've selected the folder. See, it's now it's in folder. You select folder right there. Now, as it, and this is the, when you select uh, extract, now files will be extracted to the G folder, which we know the G folder is the folder that the um, the SD card is in. So then we simply click extract. Now, it's gonna go through this whole deal here. We're not gonna let it go through it. I'm gonna stop the computer, uh, stop the camera again, and I'll show you what happens next. All right, now it's finished unzipping it and extracting it to the SD card. I'm gonna double click on the SD cards right down here. That brings up this Garmin file. And if you double click on it, it just simply tells you there's the updates and that, that's everything you need right there. <laughs> that's it. Take this, take this uh, card, simply in, uh, turn your fish finder on and insert this card. There it is. I pulled it out so that's why it went away. But you'll simply insert, insert this card or this card, depending on which unit you have, and maybe an SD card or a micro SD card, you'll simply insert this card into your unit, and then it will prompt you to upload, uh, update your unit, and you'll follow the on-screen prompts. Very easy, very simple. All right, guys, here's another one of them, you know, great Louisiana Latin apps, a little extra, little bonus. Um, a a chart, uh, I got it from a guy uh, that I know, he, he allowed me to use this. It's a chart that, it, it helps you navigate the menus much better. Sometimes you can get lost in these menus. Uh, you can get lost uh, trying, to, trying to find your way, you know, to the appearance section or to change the color palettes or to change color game, you know, sonar default. Uh, resetting the sonar depot. There's so many ways that you can get yourself lost inside these menus and it can be very frustrating. Well, I give this menu, it's a it's a, a chart, a diagram that allows you to easily navigate through the menus. And by doing that, it makes it easier and less frustrating on you. So what I've done here is I'm gonna put this, this talking pretty much will be in the background and we'll t and I'll have this menu up. You can actually print this menu, and um, you know, run off. And I, what I suggest is laminating a copy and putting it in your boat. And it, it's great to have to put in your boat and things like that. It, it's really amazing uh, to have on your, uh, you know, just throw it under your console, things like that. But guys, take a look at this menu. Pause the screen. Take a snapshot of it and get yourself a laminated copy of this, and it is amazing. But, guys, I think this right here is one of the things that um, my customers love so much, and maybe you'll love it too.
Okay, guys, in closing this, uh, this class out, I want to say that the hope that you have got a better understanding of not only how to use your live scope, how to target different species with it, the accessories that you may use to, to increase uh, your success on the water, but I also hope you have a better understanding of how to adjust it. And adjustments are the key to the game. Uh, making those fine-tuned adjustments to really see what you want. I mean, choosing the right color palette, choosing the right game for the situation you're in, and understanding whether to use forward mode or perspective mode to target the fish you're in and the situation you're in. Some of that stuff can be seen overwhelming, but if you follow the few simple uh, tips and tricks that I gave you, it can be simplified and be very easy. Now, the good thing about this class is, not only do you have this class, but every class comes with a phone consultation with me. You are able to call me personally, and we get on the phone, and if need be, we can talk through some of the problems, and, get a, and you can ask me questions and get a better understanding of some of the stuff we covered in the class. There is no other class like this, and I am so happy that you chose to purchase this class and, and I'm also waiting on your phone call because one of my favorite things is talking to the people that, um, that I help. I love, I've been helping people for a long time and with this phone call, you're gonna get much more than just a simple, the YouTube messages or the Facebook messages. You're getting a phone consultation through me and that right there is going to help you better understand and we will get that unit dialed in as beautiful as you've ever seen. But guys, thank you so much for purchasing and trusting in me to get you on the water faster, catching fish faster. Because they say, if you're not scoping, you're hoping. Thanks for watching. Thank you so much for purchasing this unit. And I cannot wait for your phone call.